It was St. Valentine's Day, and Walt and Emily were enjoying a romantic dinner under the candlelight. Emily had spent the entire day cleaning, decorating the house, and cooking. Walt opened the wine while eating the first dish. Wow, Emily, this meat is wonderful. I've never tasted a stew this delicious. You're the best. Everything you make is great. Emily hadn't taken a bite yet. She seemed sad. Between laughter, Walt said, Aren't you hungry? If you don't hurry, I'm going to eat it all. Or are you saving space for dessert? I know everything between you and Margaret, said Emily suddenly. Walt drank all the wine in his glass with a single gulp. Margot? I... I don't know what you're talking about, dear. What's going on? Emily then started to sweep off the breadcrumbs on the table. You don't need to lie to me anymore. You don't need to lie to me anymore. She showed me all the photos and messages. I know everything. An uncomfortable silence filled the room. And then, trying to grab his wife's hand, Walt said, Emily, I... I'm sorry. It all got out of hand and I never wanted to hurt you. But I love her. I love you both. I know it's difficult to understand, but I just can't kick her out of my life. The two started to cry. Walt didn't know what to do. Emily had been his first love, and he had shared everything with her. He loved the life that they had built together, but when he met Margot, everything changed. He couldn't understand how he could love two women at the same time, and so intensely. But that's how things were, and he wasn't capable of choosing just one. Do you actually love her? Yes, said Walt. I don't expect you to understand, but I love you too, Emily, and I've never stopped loving you. Do you have her in your heart? asked Emily. Yes, like I told you, I do love her. Emily then lifted her gaze from the table, looked directly at Walt with her shining eyes and said, Did you enjoy the meat in this too? Walt got really pale and shook his head in negation. Now you also have Margaret inside of you, and so you can now be with both me and her forever. Rocio had been invited to a Valentine's Day party at the new cabin of her best friend. However, her parents didn't allow her to go because the cabin was still under construction and it was located high in a mountain, making the place dangerous to be in. Since she didn't want to be alone on February 14th, she convinced her parents to let her boyfriend spend the day at her house. In her head, it sounded like a good plan and she also felt excited about introducing her boyfriend to her parents. However, when Valentine's Day came, Rocio waited for two hours, but her boyfriend was nowhere to be found. That is, until her friends called her to tell her that he was actually at the cabin with another girl. Those words hurt Rocio so much that she immediately devised a plan to escape. Tricking her parents was easy. She told them that one of her friends was hospitalized and she had to go see her. They knew their daughter never lied, so they immediately believed her and let her go. Rocio then took a taxi to the cabin and soon after found her boyfriend. And just like her friend said, he was with another girl. Rocio's screams were so loud that everyone at the party stopped what they were doing to hear her. A few minutes later, Rocio's boyfriend convinced her to get in his car. They left together, arguing while he was driving until he had to take a sharp curve and ended up crashing with another car. He was driving so fast that Rocio was shot out of the car, breaking through the windshield. The other driver and Rocio's boyfriend got off their cars. Rocio was laying on the ground at the roadside, and when they approached her, they verified that she was not breathing. Both the other driver and the boyfriend were drunk, and fearing being convicted for femicide threw her body to the mountainside. Rocio couldn't move due to the body trauma and also broke many bones during her fall but she was still alive. She spent three long days bleeding out slowly without anybody seeing her to help her. Days later, workmen heading to the mountain cabin found her dead body when they saw something strange at the bottom of the mountain during their smoke break. And her dress was no longer white. It was completely red due to all the bleeding. No evidence of a deliberate femicide was ever found, so the case was archived. The boyfriend and those who went to the party remained silent, and eventually the police finally gave up on the case, arguing it was a waste of time to keep going. However, months later, the driver of the other car confessed. And not only that, but the police also found the dead bodies of many young men in the same place where Rocio had been thrown to. 
The driver panicked, saying that the girl had come back from the dead for revenge. And from then on, every St. Valentine's Day, Rocío reappears in that road asking for help, hoping that one of the men she attacks will be one of the men responsible for her death. They say that her red dress charms men, and when she convinces them to take off their seatbelts to give them a kiss, they lose control of their cars in that curve. And just like her, they crash and are shot out of their cars, breaking through their windshields. Valentine's Day is right around the corner, TikTokers. We are sorry that maybe we're going to ruin it a little with this story, but love is not always joy and happiness. Sometimes it brings out the worst in us. Miriam was very much in love with Ramon. They had been together for six years, and two years ago, they had taken the step of living together. Their love had been like a movie, a real crush. They met at a disco when they were both 20 years old. She was dancing with her friends in the middle of the dance floor, and he was walking down the stairs with his friend Pedro. From the first step, he noticed her, who was dancing without noticing that she was being watched. He quickly drew a smile on his face and forced his friend to walk right past the group of girls. Pedro didn't understand anything, but agreed without many questions. Once there, he stared at her and put on his best smile. She, at that moment, did see him and had the same feeling as he did. Within the hour, they were talking on the armchairs in the back. From that day on, they did not separate. They both lived and studied in the city, so they began to meet first weekly and then every few days. Within two months, they had a consolidated relationship and were very happy. When they took the step of living together, they already knew each other's families and were more than settled. Living together was wonderful. Ramon was attentive and loving. The two of them shared the housework and hardly argued. Everyone was jealous of their love. Miriam organized a surprise party for February 14th to celebrate. She was a nurse and told Ramon that she was working that day, but in reality, she was not. She ordered food from one of the best restaurants in town and prepared a decorated table in a shed they had in the garden. She took the key with her, pretending to be careless so that Ramon could not get in there. The day went on forever. She had to spend time in the street until dinner time. Or rather, a little before, because she wanted to surprise him and spend some time together in the evening. At 6 o'clock, she took her car and went home. She left the car outside the garage and made the last stretch walking. Nothing could go wrong. She saw that Ramon's truck was in the garden. Surely, he had spent the afternoon cutting grass or something similar. She approached him, very excited, but when she got to the trunk of the truck, she saw that it was completely full of blood and there was a woman's purse. Her heart began to beat very fast. What did that mean? She saw that the door of the workshop that Ramon had in the garden was open, so she ran there to see what was going on. And what she saw left her totally frozen. It was Ramon with a body lying on the work table. He was cutting it into pieces. From the shock, she became dizzy and ended up on the floor. She lay there for a few minutes. Ramon, who was busy with the electric saw, did not notice anything. Once Miriam regained her composure, she decided she wanted to know the whole truth. That was very strange, but from the looks of her boyfriend, it was not the first time he had done it. She never went into his workshop. Supposedly, what he did there was to analyze dead insects and amphibians. He was a biologist and liked to try. But after what she had seen, she no longer believed anything. She hid behind a hedge in the garden and with superhuman patience waited for him to come out of the workshop. When he did, she went inside and down the stairs. There, she found the workshop of a monster. There were body parts stuffed in jars of different races and ages. Her boyfriend, her Ramon, was a serial killer. From there, she tried to call the police, but the cover prevented her. She went upstairs, but from there, she could no longer get out her cell phone. Ramon had discovered her. In a small town in Mexico lived a beautiful young woman who, since she was little, had been dreaming about having a wonderful wedding. Even before meeting her significant other, she already knew what she wanted that special day to be like. 
She even loved plain pretend but her perfect wedding. Her dress would be simple but with a big tail and she wanted to wear flowers on her head adorning her marvelous braid. The banquet would be in her house backyard and dozens of fruit trees would be there. As she grew up, she gradually got more and more obsessed about meeting he who would be her husband. And so, for her, every failure in love felt like a blow with a mallet. Until she eventually met the one and from the first day, she knew. She fell in love and just six months later, they already had a solid relationship. He was very liked in the town and he came from a wealthy but very hardworking and respected family. They lived a long and happy relationship together until finally the dreams of this young woman would finally become a reality. One summer afternoon, her boyfriend proposed to her. The next months were filled with preparations. She took out all the notebooks she had been writing on throughout the years with thousands of ideas for her wedding. With care and dedication, she prepared every detail of that long-awaited day. The food, the guests, the decorations, everything was prepared and measured to the tiniest detail. And that includes her dress, of course, which the town's tailor would be making. Everything was going according to plan and she was feeling like the happiest person in that humble town. However, just when the great ceremony was just a few hours away, a neighbor went to see the young woman to tell her that her boyfriend was cheating on her with her best friend. At that moment, she was trying on her wedding dress for the last time and became mad with jealousy. She went out of her house without taking off her dress and headed directly to where her future husband was supposedly cheating on her. And with her own eyes, she saw it was all true. The love of her life was kissing with her best friend, the very same friend who had helped her prepare the wedding. Filled with rage, she grabbed a stick she found in the lunge and started beating up both of them. It's like she was possessed by a demon and all she wanted was revenge. Bloody and ashamed, her two victims could barely defend themselves, especially when she grabbed a knife and started stabbing them both, first her best friend and then her former fiancé. Her wedding dress was now completely soaked in blood, the very one she had designed with so much care. She believed her life had no value anymore and all she wanted was to cry. Then the townsfolk treated her like a pariah. They would constantly berate her and everyone ostracized her. She knew she would be jailed sooner or later and that's the last thing she wanted, so she decided to take her own life instead. And her neighbors, far from feeling pity for her, organized a huge party to celebrate the occasion. They really hated her. And for that reason, she could never rest in peace. Her resentment and her thirst for revenge were still present in her soul and that prevented her from crossing to the afterlife. Or at least that's what the townsfolk believed. After her death, every time a young man and woman became a couple in the town, strange things would happen. The woman would frequently feel that she was being touched or would hear voices, always from a woman saying that she could not trust her boyfriend. And in most cases, the woman would end up becoming completely crazy and committing horrible acts. The townsfolk believed that this woman cast a lot of cars in the town. Since she discovered her boyfriend's betrayal, she doesn't let anybody else be happy, resulting in the town being plunged in absolute sadness. Every night, you can hear her ghost moving chairs and sewing fabric remnants as if she was still preparing her wedding. The very same wedding that led to her hating love with all her might. So, be careful if you fall in love, TikTokers, since she can always appear to traumatize your significant other. And if she is successful, you will be done for. Garrison and Talia were two happy teenagers who loved each other with all their souls. They had just finished high school and were preparing to go to university together. 
Everyone said they were made for each other, and although they weren't engaged, they had each given each other a ring symbolizing their union. That same summer, Garson began to suffer constant dizziness and headaches. At first, he didn't care, but Talia began to worry and urged him to get some tests done. When the results came in, their little fantasy fell apart. Garrison had a strange disease that affected his blood supply and was consuming him beyond repair. Soon, the worst symptoms became visible. Garrison lost all vitality, was very thin and emaciated and dragged his feet like a zombie. Talia struggled to find a cure, but the doctors gave her no hope. They could only prolong his life through blood transfusions. Luckily, they both had the same blood type and Talia didn't hesitate to offer herself. During the treatment, Talia held Garson's head and whispered to him not to worry, that they would always be together one way or another. However, their efforts were insufficient and Garson ended up passing away after a few weeks. <laughs> Talia plunged into despair and ended up falling into solitude. She had lost her other half and nothing made sense anymore. She dropped out of university and locked herself in her apartment, obsessed with the hundreds of photos and videos she had of the two of them. On one of her sleepless nights, browsing an occult website, she found a person who might be able to help her. Karina was an old woman with a great reputation as a spiritualist, who was connected to black magic and witchcraft. Talia went to see her right away, told her everything she had suffered for her lover, and that she was willing to do anything to be with him again. Despite the power she had, Karina was reticent. One shouldn't play with black magic, because it can turn against oneself. But Talia insisted, and the old woman explained what she had to do. In the middle of the night, she sneaked into the cemetery to dig up Garson's grave and get to his coffin. She took out a pair of pliers and mustered the courage to cut off her own finger, the one with the ring on it, and left it next to her lovers in the grave. The days passed and Taylor remained in seclusion, waiting for a sign. On another sleepless night, she suddenly felt someone knock on the door. When she looked out the window, her heart stopped at the sight of Garrison's figure, his Bayman smile glowing in the dark. She ran to the door, but she fell apart when she opened it and she saw no one outside. She slammed the door shut again and fell to her knees, desperate. Lack of sleep and appetite began to take a toll on Talia's health, making her appear increasingly thin and haggard. She had no enthusiasm for anything and walked with her head down, hunched over on her right side as if she were dragging a great weight. Her family and friends no longer recognized her, and she herself began to worry. She tried to take care of herself a bit, eat more and rest, but she couldn't get better. Her enormous circles under her eyes didn't fade, and she was getting weaker and hunched over. But the worst thing was that Gerson hadn't come back to her. Desperate, she went to see the old woman to ask her what was happening to her. Her blood rang cold when she replied that everything had gone perfectly and that soon she would be with her lover. All she had to do was to stand in front of the mirror that same night, at midnight, and take a picture of her reflection. Talia didn't understand anything but evaded the old woman. She waited all night in front of the mirror, observing how her body was emaciated. She looked like a walking corpse, and that right arm that each time waited more and more. By 12 o'clock, Talia barely had the strength to hold her little Polaroid camera and take a picture. This was revealed little by little, showing in detail the marks of her skin and the veins showing. But something else appeared in the photo that left her paralyzed. Clinging to her right arm was Garrison, who was dragging piteously on the floor, as pale as his corpse had been the night his coffin had been defiled. From his mouth protruded a twisted tongue that dug into Talia's veins, sucking her blood, taking her life. With her last strength, she threw the camera against the mirror, which broke into a thousand pieces, and she passed out on the floor. The police arrived at the house, alerted by the noise that the neighbors heard, and there they found Talia's body. Based on her appearance, the coroner ruled that she had been dead for several weeks and no one gave importance to the photo on the floor of the two lovers embracing and smiling. They buried her in the same grave and the two were always together.
Yes, I killed him. Who? Well, the man who laughed at me for so many years. And to be honest, killing him wasn't even hard. But I never thought about how difficult it would be to get rid of a corpse. At first I thought about quartering and then burning him, but I realized that cutting up his bones would be really hard. And so I opted to just burn the entire body. It was 11 p.m. and as I was about to carry his cold body into my car, my neighbor Margarita appeared. She asked me what I was doing and all I could think of saying was that I was going to drive around for a bit to clear my head. But so late at night? She asked, a bit weirded out. Uh, yeah, I'm still very shaken after separating from Sergio. And so she looked down and felt pity for me. She offered to help me with whatever I needed and let me go. The issue was that the corpse was still in the house behind the door. So I had to go into the car without the body and then I set off to drive aimlessly for about 20 minutes. When I got back, Margarita and her husband were sitting in their front yard. They waved at me, so I smiled back at them and went back into my house. And the stench was unbearable. I never thought the body would start stinking so soon. I looked at the plastic bag on the floor containing the body of the one man I had loved more than any other. I had to get rid of his body soon. We humans really are so unimportant that when we die, we show what we truly are. Nothing but a bag of rotten flesh. I changed plans and went back to my original idea. Cut him up into pieces and then burn them. I decided I would get up in the morning and then go by the tools that would help me quarter him. My alarm clock went off at 9am. I opened my eyes and saw the sunlight shining through the windows. I took a shower, got dressed, and drove to the supermarket. Not many people were there at that time. Perfect, less witnesses. I decided to buy a chainsaw as well as a few wooden planks to not raise suspicion. You can never be too cautious. And once I had my new tools, I drove back home. My backyard was enclosed with tall walls and the surrounding houses were not tall enough for the neighbors to be able to peek inside. Thus, I would have all the privacy I needed. The process was difficult at first. Having to see his face covered in blood, his pale lips, his silky hair, which I so loved to caress. But at least the most difficult part was done. All I had to do now was finish what I started. Later on, the chainsaw made a noise that really scared me at first. I thought it was going to break. However, I then noticed that it could cut bones so well and fast that all my fears vanished. That chainsaw was even better than what the young man at the store who offered it to me said. Fortunately, I finished the job soon and looking at all of those human pieces, I thought about how much love ended up reduced to bone shards and chunks of flesh. I carefully picked up all the pieces and put them inside metallic paint buckets which were empty. Then I added a bit of gasoline to each bucket and threw a lit match at each one of them. Then a thick smoke suddenly started emerging from the buckets as well as a strong smell of gasoline mixed with paint. In that moment I realized it wasn't a good idea to get rid of the corpse in my house. I feared that so much smoke would alert the neighbors. But then, I had the perfect idea. I went to a room, took out all of Sergio's clothes from the wardrobe and put them in the burning buckets. In that moment, someone rang the doorbell. I looked through the spy hole and it was Margarita again. I quickly took off my dress and put on my pajamas before opening the door. Are you okay? We saw smoke coming from your backyard. Margarita asked. Yeah, thank you for asking, Margarita. The thing is that I I hope you don't judge me for the terrible thing I just did. My neighbor got tense and asked me what happened. For a moment, the idea of confessing to her my perfect crime appeared in my mind. Margarita, besides being my neighbor, was also a good friend. She had always been there to help me. 
Whenever I rushed out of the house crying after Sergio's abuses, she would invite me into her home and let me spend the night there. However, reason intervened and I realized I would have to keep that secret in me until the day I died. I thought about how to get out of what I just said and I told her. Well, since I was so mad at Sergio, I burned all of his clothes. I don't want to have anything in the house that reminds me of him. I need to rebuild my life. Margarita innocently rushed towards me to give me a big hug and, as always, she gave me words of encouragement. I couldn't help but cry, but I was happy. Sergio was dead. I would never suffer again because of him. I then asked Margarita to please leave me alone, telling her that I needed time for myself. And so I went back to my backyard and I sat back to relax and see the buckets burn. After a while, I realized it had been two days since I had eaten anything. I was so nervous and scared that I didn't feel hungry. So I went to the kitchen to make breakfast. And when I was about to enjoy my meal, someone rang the doorbell again, but I didn't feel like answering to anybody. I ignored the doorbell and enjoyed my breakfast sandwich. However, whoever was at the door didn't go away and kept on ringing the doorbell. I didn't even go to the front door to see who it was. I went to the backyard and picked everything up. I flushed in the toilet the remaining ashes that were still in the buckets, and I buried next to my rose bushes the bones that didn't turn to ash. I washed the paint buckets with dishwashing soap and the doorbell kept ringing. That's when I started getting worried. Did someone see me and call the police? The only person who saw me was Margarita, but she would never betray me, would she? So I decided to finally open the door and face whatever was on the other side. There was no evidence in the house. I cleaned everything thoroughly. And when I opened the door, I felt as if my soul abandoned my body and then came back. I felt as if the ground beneath me was breaking and I was left floating in the air. Drops of cold sweat quickly started running through my forehead. I couldn't speak a single word. I could only make mindless sounds. I felt all the blood in my body go into my feet and then rush up to my head as if my heart was trying to get out of my mouth. I stepped back and I saw Sergio come into the house without looking at me as if nothing ever happened. Hello, horror lovers. Today we bring you a tragic love story in the same vein as Romeo and Juliet. The protagonists are Rosario and Joel, two teenagers who lived in Durango, Mexico. They knew each other since they were kids and became a couple while still in high school. On one school party, Joel gave Rosario an artificial rose. It was a symbol of love and commitment. And it wasn't in vain because in the following years, they became closer than ever. They made a lot of plans together and dreamed about forming a beautiful family one day. They would become doctors and their dream was to live in the countryside and have two children. Their families were delighted with their relationship and everything looked like a fairy tale. Unfortunately, when they were about to finish university, Joel died in a car accident. Rosario was completely devastated. She spent many years mourning her loss and would always carry with her the artificial rose Joel had given her. However, her heartbreak healed over time and she kept going on with her life. Then years later she met a man who made her fall in love again, Enrique. Although she always seemed hesitant about rebuilding her life, Enrique taught her that she could love again. They became a couple and she started to feel happy again. However, every time Rosario looked at Joel's rose, the memories she shared with him would make her feel deeply sad. Thus, she had to turn the page and start over. And so, she decided to give Joel back his rose. One afternoon, she put it in her purse and went to the graveyard. She left it on top of Joel's grave while she told him that she would never forget him, but she needed to move on. Enrique supported Rosario and she felt better in the following days. She was very happy about being able to retake the path she had abandoned so many years ago. However, things wouldn't be so easy and she would soon realize it. A month after she went to the graveyard, Rosario found Joel's artificial rose. Lying right on her bed, she felt a shiver go down her spine as soon as she saw it. Rosario was sure Enrique wouldn't do something so macabre. It was impossible he would dare to do such a thing. 
but she called him just in case. Sure enough, it wasn't him, and nobody else had copies of the keys of the apartment. She sat down for a while, looking at that artificial flower that brought her so many memories. And then she asked, as if thinking out loud, what does this mean? And suddenly she froze in horror as she heard someone say, you promised you would be mine forever. The shock was too intense for Rosario's heart, who suffered a heart attack right there and then, dying instantly. It is said that when she was buried, she carried in her hands that artificial flower Joel had given her when they were still kids. And from then on, it was certain that their love would last forever. How far are you willing to go for love? Today, we'll share with you a story where attachment and devotion went over the limits of reason. Many years ago, in a faraway town lived a married couple who had been together for more than a decade. Laura had a strong temper and everyone in the town knew it was better to not get into trouble with her. In contrast, Carlos was pretty docile, would agree with her on everything and would constantly submit to his wife's whims. However, it came to a point where living with Laura became unbearable. One afternoon, when Carlos was walking back home from work, he came across a beautiful woman. When he saw her clothes and her shape, he immediately knew she wasn't from around there. Her car broke and Carlos offered to help her. While he checked the engine, the two started to chat, getting to know each other. And the chemistry was so strong between them that they ended up kissing. The attraction between the two was so strong that she convinced him to get in her car and abandon the home Carlos hated so much. Laura, seeing many hours had passed by and Carlos wasn't home yet, decided to look for him in the town. She asked all of the neighbors about him until one said to have seen him in a car with a woman. That's when her heart was shattered and a dark thought tormented her. Carlos had got tired and abandoned her. She fell on her knees and started weeping uncontrollably. <laughs> Laura waited and waited, hoping for him to change his mind and come back. However, five years went by and she heard nothing from him. Desperate, she decided to ask the town elder for help, a popular and alleged witch supposedly capable of performing miracles. Laura asked her about the whereabouts of her husband and the elder entering a trance contacted spirits who informed her of the truth. Carlos now lived in a city with the woman he met and with her he had two children. Laura, furious, asked the elder if there was any way to get him back. She was willing to do anything. The witch told her that there was one way, to cast a very strong binding spell which would make him come back and stay by her side forever. Without hesitating, Laura accepted. After a few days, she couldn't believe it. Carlos came back, begging for forgiveness on his knees. Thus, Laura forgave him and they started a new life together. However, destiny conspired once again against her. One day, while Carlos was coming back from work, he was assaulted by muggers who killed him in cold blood. Laura, filled with grief, just couldn't believe it. They were supposed to be together forever. And that's how it was. Little by little, she started to experience strange presences in the house, such as murmurs, weeping, figures in the dark. And every night, she felt that someone would lie by her side, hugging her. She couldn't find an explanation, until one night she woke up very startled, and when she turned around, she had a horrible vision. The face of a decomposing corpse looking directly at her with worms and flies coming out of its eyes and mouth. <coughs> Terrified, Laura rushed out of their house and went to the town's priest to confess what she had done and beg for forgiveness. The priest told her that what she did was inhuman, that Carla's soul would no longer be able to rest, and had been condemned to always come back to the world of the living to be by her side. The priest couldn't do anything to help her and Laura would have to endure the presence of Carlos' spirit until she died, as that's what she wished for with the binding spell. Her life became hell and day after day she would go to Carlos' grave to ask him for forgiveness and to leave her alone. She secluded herself and nobody saw her again, that is, until a relative went to her house to visit her to see how she was doing and found her hanging from the yard's tree. 
At long last, the two lovebirds could finally be together as equals. Welcome back, horror lovers. You can't deny that human beings are distrustful by nature. When in doubt, many times we tend to think ill of others, even if they're very close to us. This is the story of a man who really mistrusted his greatest love, bringing him terrible consequences. It happened at the beginning of the previous century, when customs were different, especially in regards to romantic relationships, and the higher the social class, the more restrictive everything was. The young lads from the nobility would politely court the ladies, always with permission from her family. They could not have dates alone. That was immoral and would immediately cause rumors among people. They had to wait to be married to have intimacy. Matilda and Alonzo knew each other since childhood. Their families owned huge plots of farmland and kept a close friendship for many generations. When they saw them playing as kids, they already saw them being together in the future, merging the riches of both houses. Thus, due to their closeness and pressure from their parents, it was natural for them to end up becoming a couple, as well as getting engaged. However, like in every arranged marriage, they both had their doubts. Alonso didn't trust Matilda's true character. He was feeling he didn't know her true personality and only knew the exterior facade she showed. He tried getting closer to her, looking for a moment when they could be alone, but she was very prude and always avoided that. Then one night, shortly before their wedding, Alonzo thought of the perfect excuse. They would use an old empty mansion he owned to organize a huge party with all their friends and celebrate the occasion. Thus, being away from the family, he would finally have his chance. However, the night didn't start as he expected, and during dinner, Matilda focused more on serving the guests instead of being with him. After that, they all gathered at the big main hall to look for something to do. The guests were all pretty excited, and Matilda innocently proposed to them to play hide-and-seek. The idea was great, and she chose Alonzo as the first one to seek the others. He immediately understood her plan. If he could find Matilda, they would finally be able to be together. The guests hid in different parts of the house, while the soon-to-be groom counted while facing one corner, to then go look for them. One by one he found each guest, who would go back to the main hall to have fun. However, after it was midnight and looking around the entire house, Alonzo had found everyone, except for one person. Matilda was nowhere to be found. Worried, Alonzo gave up and asked the others to help him find her. They searched the entire house, looking in every nook and cranny, from the basement to the attic. But it was futile. Nobody found the soon-to-be a bride. The search expanded to the neighboring areas, and Alonzo's fear turned into anger when the guests started to speculate that maybe Matilda had run away. Suddenly, everything made sense in his mind. Matilda completely changed her mind about marrying, and taking advantage of being away from her family, she proposed a game of hide-and-seek to be able to run away from Alonzo. She had abandoned him like a dog, leaving him humiliated in front of everyone. The next day, with no news about Matilda, the marriage was cancelled, and Alonzo never wanted to hear about her ever again. Nobody saw Matilda again, although some claimed to have seen her running away in the middle of the night, joined by another man. Young Alonzo, with his heart broken, didn't take long to engage with another lady from another wealthy family and got married within a year. And despite Alonzo's reluctance, they decided to go live at the family mansion where everything happened. While the servants cleaned everything and prepared the mansion for the newlyweds, one of the maids found in one of the most remote rooms, an old chest that seemed to have been locked for years. She looked for the key to open it and see what was inside. And when she opened the lid, a stream of horror resounded around the entire house. Everyone rushed to the room to discover, in horror, that within the chest was the lifeless body of a woman, with her clothes worn down and her flesh decomposing. From her dress, Alonzo immediately knew who it was. Matilda, the one he harshly condemned that fateful night while she was stuck in that chest, unable to get out. My life was wonderful. I was married to an incredible woman, and together we would fulfill our lifelong dream of becoming parents. But out of nowhere, everything went to hell, and now I'm dead inside. Sometimes it's difficult for me to distinguish reality from fiction. Every night I hear my wife weep near me, just like if she was by my side. 
But that's impossible, so I convinced myself that it was all a product of my imagination. A few days ago, my siblings came to visit me. They would stay in my big house, which unfortunately is always very empty. However, for me, it was a relief to have them spend a few days with me and give me company. They knew how bad I was feeling. One of those nights, after dinner, we stayed up late talking. We reminisced about my wife and the happy times when we would have barbecues and would fantasize about our future. Those memories are what keep me going nowadays. When we ended our conversation, we all went to our rooms. It was pretty late and we all needed to rest. And just like every night, as soon as I got into my bed, I started hearing that terrible weeping. It broke my heart not being able to help my love. I tried to think about something else, so my own mind could maybe leave me alone. But suddenly, my sister strongly knocked on my door and asked me to let her come in. As soon as I saw her face, I could tell I wasn't the only one able to hear that weeping. However, how could it be? I could see the terrified expression on my sister's face, and she was struggling to articulate even a single word. When she calmed down a bit, she asked me if I heard the same thing she heard. I obviously responded that I did and told her that I had been hearing that for months. My sister got so scared that she excused herself and told me that she had to go, that she couldn't be at my house for one more second, and I was left there waiting for the weeping to start again at any moment and for my torment to continue. My other siblings were sleeping deeply and didn't find out about what happened. As expected, a few minutes later the weeping started again, but this time it was different. After what my sister did, I couldn't just stay there and do nothing. So my first impulse was to take my clothes and head to the graveyard. I jumped over the graveyard's fence and I hid from the guard until I reached her grave. Lords, I'm here my love. You know perfectly well that it wasn't your fault. Please stop weeping and take care of our baby. I'll be with you soon, okay? I said as I got closer to her. I kept telling her that I missed her very much, but I needed peace. Hearing her weeping wasn't helping me. I'm not sure why, but I went back to sleep feeling calmer, and after many weeks of sleeping poorly, I could finally rest. Unfortunately, the peace was short-lived, and two days later I heard the weeping again, this time more intense. Desperate, I tried visiting her again. That went on for one week. Every day I would go back to the graveyard, but the crying wouldn't stop. I couldn't take it anymore, and I was going crazy. Thus, one night, when the weeping was more intense than ever, I decided to do the unthinkable. I grabbed a pickaxe and a shovel and decided to take her out of there. I removed the slabs carefully and silently so the guard wouldn't hear, and I dug as fast as I could. After two hours of digging, I finally reached her coffin. Before opening it, I covered my nose since I was sure the smell would be nauseating. But it wasn't. When I opened it, I felt a deep peace. I remembered the joy with which we received the news that we were going to be parents, and how everything went to hell because of her terrible pregnancy complications. At that moment, I was no longer me. I was disoriented and lost. I moved her to the side to lie next to her, and I hugged her. And as incredible as it may seem, we talked about many things. We shared how much we missed each other and I just let myself go with their words. The next day, all the newspapers opened with the following news. It was found, the body of a man who unearthed his wife's corpse to sleep one last time with her. Without knowing, that would also be his last night alive. Hello, my name is John. Today I need to vent and tell my story. Years ago, I met Anna. We were two young people who seemed destined to be together. We spent hours talking about our dreams, sharing laughter, and exploring a world full of possibilities. The spark between us was undeniable, and the attraction and passion grew more every day. We ended up together and got married. The wedding was an unforgettable day for both of us. I can't describe what I felt when I realized that we would be together forever. I would be her partner and she would be mine until the end of our days. However, as it happens in many relationships, over time, cracks began to appear. At first, these were small discrepancies in our opinions and tastes. But soon I noticed that Anna was beginning to distance herself. 
Deep, passionate conversations became rarer, replaced by awkward silences and monosyllabic responses. She seemed lost in thought, and although my intuition told me something was wrong, I held on to the belief that our relationship could overcome any obstacle. One of the first warning signs was his sudden interest in spending more time away from home. Her work meetings became more and more frequent, and the hours she spent away extended into the night. And no, don't call me sexist or old or tell me that I didn't trust my wife, because I know you're thinking that. I tried to stay calm, trusting that she had reasons for being gone for so long. But the shadow of doubt was already hanging over our relationship. One night, when Anna returned home after one of her supposed meetings, I noticed her averted gaze and trembling hands. I asked her about her day, and she was evasive. My suspicions grew, but I didn't want to think about the possibility that she was being unfaithful to me. The evidence of her deception slowly began to accumulate. I discovered a perfume on her clothes that I didn't recognize, and on one occasion, I found a small hoop earring in the back seat of our car. I knew it wasn't hers, I'm very observant, and she always wore big, colorful earrings. When I presented this evidence to her, Anna always had an excuse ready. The perfume was a gift from a friend, and the earring must have fallen from a co-worker. Despite these signs, my love for my wife was so deep that I refused to accept the reality before my eyes. I believed in the sincerity of her words, but I didn't ignore the mysterious calls she received late at night. That her phone was always on silent, or that when she had it in her hands, she would walk away from me as if she were hiding something. Every message or call increased my worry. Confirmation of her infidelity came when one day, while she was showering, I went to her laptop to look for a bill that had arrived in her email. Searching for the document I needed, I found a message that took my breath away. It was a compromising email from an unnamed sender. The content detailed secret encounters and passionate adventures. My hands shook as I read each word and the pain I felt was unbearable. I felt guilty for invading her privacy, but my need for answers was overwhelming. I couldn't resist the temptation and sent a message, pretending to be her. What I received in return was a curt response. I got the impression that that person knew Anna very well. I knew it wasn't her, perhaps because of my way of writing. I couldn't contain myself and I told my wife. And once again, Anna managed to convince me that it was spam or some kind of bad joke. She assured me that she didn't know who had written that to her, and indeed, she hadn't answered it. I desperately wanted to believe her. Although the evidence of her infidelity was evident, my love for Anna was a chain that kept me trapped in a relationship that was slowly falling apart. The struggle between what I knew and what I wanted created a constant tension within me, and reality mixed with denial in a whirlpool that seemed to have no end. My mornings and breakfast alone began with the same question in mind. Where had Anna been last night? Her response when I got it was usually vague and evasive. She said she had work meetings or impromptu dinners with friends who needed her support. But the lack of details in her nervous demeanor were telling. So like a detective, I've begun my search for answers. The first step was to find out what she was hiding on her phone. It wasn't easy, as she almost never left it unattended, and on the few opportunities I had, I scanned it for suspicious messages or calls. But she was clever, erasing any compromising traces and keeping her main apps locked with a password. So I started following their social media closely. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter… No platform was safe from my scrutiny. Anna used to be very active, sharing photos, stories and details of her life. However, I noticed that she had started to be more cautious. Her photos were more ambiguous, and her interactions had become more private. Mysterious comments or likes began to appear on her posts, which increased my suspicions. My heart was pounding, but I knew I needed more than a like and a photo to confront an argument like that with my wife. One afternoon, after another day full of doubts and suspicions, I decided to seek support from someone I could trust. My sister-in-law, Marta, my brother's wife. I had always had a close relationship with her, and I knew I could count on her advice if difficult times. So after taking a deep breath, I decided to call her and ask her to meet me. 
We met in a cosy little cafe that we used to go to on occasions. Marta immediately noticed the concern on my face and asked me what was happening. I was hesitant at first, but finally decided to open up and tell her everything. Marta, I need to talk to you about something that is destroying me inside. I said with a broken voice. She looked at me worriedly and shakily and encouraged me to continue. I explained in detail everything that was happening in my marriage to Anna, from the signs of her infidelity to my failed attempts to get answers. Marta listened attentively, nodding silently as she spoke. When I finished telling my story, she took my hand understandingly. John, I'm so sorry you're going through this. It must be incredibly difficult, she said empathetically. I nodded sadly. It is, Marta. I'm caught between what I know and what I want to believe. I don't want to lose Anna, but I also can't ignore all the evidence I find every day. Marta sighed and looked deeply into my eyes. She told me that trust was essential in a marriage. But what could I do? Rather, what should I do? I grabbed a tissue to wipe away all the tears that were on my face. My sister-in-law pondered for a moment and then spoke calmly. She told me that communication was key in any relationship. She encouraged me to tell her how I felt and to listen to her response. Because sometimes things weren't what they seemed. I looked at her, grateful for her advice. You're right, communication is key. But what do I do if she keeps denying everything? Marta smiled at me and assured me that everything would be fine. She was sure that my wife would not be unfaithful to me. The truth is that her words calm me a lot, because in addition to having a very good relationship with me, she also knew Anna well. Although it had been several months since the four of us had been together with my brother, she could give me advice and better understand what was going on in my wife's head, after all. She was also a woman, and there was a special connection between them, which was sometimes incomprehensible among men. I appreciated the support and trust that Marta gave me. I felt a little relief, thinking that maybe my paranoia was exaggerating things. I decided to follow her advice and try to talk openly and honestly with my wife. After our conversation, I felt stronger and determined to deal with the situation in an adult way. The next few days were difficult as I waited for an opportunity to have that crucial conversation with her. Suspicions were still running through my head, but I tried to stay calm and not jump to conclusions. My goal was to solve our problems, not accuse without solid evidence. Finally, one afternoon, while Anna and I were sharing dinner at home, I found the right moment to broach the topic. I took a deep breath and told her that we had to talk, that I had noticed that things were a little complicated lately, and I couldn't continue with so many doubts. She looked at me with surprise, as if she wasn't expecting that conversation. I explained to her how distant I had felt from her in recent months, and how suspicions of infidelity had begun to affect our relationship. I asked her to be honest with me and share her feelings. She seemed uncomfortable, but finally started talking and assured me that there was no extramarital affair. I decided to trust her sincerity. I accepted that, as Marta had suggested, perhaps things weren't what they seemed. Over the next few weeks, Anna and I worked on rebuilding our relationship. We openly communicated our needs and concerns and began spending more time together. It seemed that things were gradually improving and my hope that we could overcome this crisis grew day by day. However, one night, as I was leaving the house in search of some fresh air to clean my head, something happened that changed everything again. While walking through a vacant lot near our neighborhood, I saw a car parked in a secluded corner. As I approached it, I recognized Marta's car, my sister-in-law. Intrigued, I slowly approached the vehicle, thinking there might have been some problem. It was a strange place in time to be there, so I didn't hesitate to check out how she was. But what I saw through the car window left me completely stunned and frozen to the spot. Inside the car, I saw Anna and Marta both naked. They were in an intimate and compromising situation that I could not believe. My heart sunk and a wave of emotions washed over me. I was paralyzed, unable to process what I was saying. Those furtive glances, that intensity with which they touched each other, their bodies, naked and intertwined inside the car, gave off a burning desire that was palpable even from outside. They embraced each other with unbridled passion, their hands eagerly covering every inch of the other's skin. 
Sighs escaped their lips as they gave themselves over completely to the last of the moment. Tears filled my eyes as I watched the scene, feeling doubly betrayed and hurt. First for my wife, but also for my sister-in-law, who had deceived me in that hypocritical way with that advice, trying to guide my attention elsewhere. After all, on that afternoon of confessions in the cafe, I had been telling her my worries and looking into the eyes of my wife's lover. She had laughed in my face, I couldn't understand how they could have come to this. My mind was blank and I didn't know what to do. My hands shook as I watched the betrayal unfold before my eyes. My mind was filled with the whirlwind of emotions. Anger, sadness, confusion? I didn't know how to react, but fury began to grow inside me like a ravenous flame. I walked away from the car in a state of shock, trying to process what I had just witnessed. The images of Anna and Marta remained etched in my mind, torturing me mercilessly. When I returned home, the tension in the air was palpable. Anna must have noticed something was wrong, but I didn't mention anything she had seen. Instead, I chose to wait and plan my revenge, calmly. The betrayal was so deep that I felt I couldn't sit idly by. I needed to make them pay for their deception. I'd realized that justice wouldn't be enough. I wanted to see them suffer as much as I was. I began to devise an elaborate plan to make them pay for their actions, one that would plunge them into terror and despair. The next night, I followed my wife in the car to a jazz bar in the center of the city. She was dressed in a sensual outfit, very different from her usual style. I saw how she met Marta in the entrance, exchanging smiles and looking full of desire. How naive I felt. If I had seen that image a thousand times before, it would never have crossed my mind that they had a secret relationship. I got out of the car and dressed in a raincoat and a hat, I decided to follow them into the bar. I didn't know what I was going to do when I saw them, but my body pushed me to confirm that my eyes hadn't deceived me that night. The inside of the bar was quite dark, but it wasn't difficult for me to find them. My heart pounded in my chest as I blended into the crowd, trying to blend in. The soft music and lights created a very romantic atmosphere. I sat in the corner, watching their every move. Then I reached into my pocket and noticed I had a knife. I didn't even remember when I had left it there. My mind was filled with a mixture of terror and anguish. How had our relationship gotten to that point? When I saw them put in on their coats to go out, I got ready to do it too. I followed them to their car and surprised them. I tied them violently with a sadistic smile on my face. I revealed to them all the evidence I had accumulated and promised them that they would suffer the same pain and humiliation that I had experienced. I took them home and in the basement for days I subjected them to unimaginable physical and psychological torture. Their pleas and screams echoed between the four walls, but I was blinded by hatred and the thirst for revenge. The horror they experienced at my hands became an endless nightmare. I started by cutting my sister-in-law's hair. I shaved it to zero, leaving her bald. Then I continued with my wife. I looked at them with tears and asked them if they were still attracted to each other. But it was not enough for me. I continued cutting off one ear so that they could no longer hear themselves, then several fingers, so that their dirty and treacherous hands could no longer be felt. I was ready to continue with the eyes to take away the sight that had allowed them to meet and seduce each other, but I collapsed. Despite all that, the satisfaction I expected to feel never came. Instead, I found myself mired in an abyss of guilt and despair. What I had done hadn't brought me the peace I sought, but had worsened my own inner darkness. My hands were stained with blood, I didn't recognize myself. Finally, unable to bear the agony any longer, I decided to free them both. I would set them free, but their lives would be marked by the trauma I had inflicted on them. I knew they could never be the same again, just like me. I should have resolved it differently, told her things clearly and let her go with another woman if that made her happy. My obsession with revenge had turned me into a monster, and now I was faced with the consequences of my actions. Trembling, the two cried and hacked each other with their bloody, fingerless hands, running their palms over each other's cheeks and telling each other that everything would be okay. 
I sat there, staring at them while they helped cover the bleeding that was getting bigger and bigger. When they were about to walk out of the door, Anna turned to look at me one last time, with hatred in her eyes, and I had to do it. I was selfish, yes. I couldn't stand the idea of the two of them rebuilding a happy life together, loving each other while I rotted behind bars. Was I going to turn myself into the police? Yes. But at the last moment, I decided to grab a pen and paper and tell you this story and ask you, what would you have done? I grabbed my wife's corpse, caressed her head, so soft and hairless for the last time. She was still as beautiful as the day I met her. And hugging her, I shot my temple, ending my torment. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it. And if you want to see more Draw My Life videos, subscribe to our channel. See you in the next episode!